Welcome back to another episode of Mike Reads. Today we're going to be doing a special episode because the results of the polling are in on which book I should be reading with my next read, either Thomas Sowell's Economic Facts and Fallacies or Henry, Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. And well, folks, the results are a, a tie. So what I'm going to try to do is simultaneously do both reads. So tonight, for example, I'll be doing, well, today, for example, I'll be doing a, a read on uh, Henry Hazlitt. Let's economics in one lesson, and then uh, in the next read, I'll, I'll try to go. I'll, I'll try to alternate between the two books as best as I can. Um, the way I'm going to go about this is to just do a 10 to 20 minute read in each book. Um, Henry Hazlitt's read, Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, actually breaks it up kind of nicely into single chapter reads. Except for tonight, it's going to be a two chapter read. Today, excuse me, it's going to be a two chapter read. Um, and then at the end of each read, um, by popular request, I'm going to do a bit of an an analysis. Um, an explanation of what we just read so people can not only get a better understanding of what we just read, but to also get some insight as to how I've interpreted um, what we've just read uh, on the grander scheme of things. Um, and hopefully that'll help people, again, better understand both my take and uh, what the lesson is that's being covered in that subject. I'm not sure how I'm going to break up economic facts and fallacies because it doesn't break up nicely into chapters since the chapters are 30-something pages long in most part, in most cases. So without further ado, uh, let's dive right on in to Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. Again, today we're going to read the first two chapters. There's a reason for that, and we will get into that in the second half of this video, which is the analysis. Um, so before I get started real quick, uh, there are two prefaces to the edition I bought, which will be we which will be linked in this video's description. So you can follow along at home with the exact version I have if you'd like. Um, there are, is a preface to the new edition, which is the one I have, and a preface to the first edition. Um, they're interesting reads, and they do provide some insight into uh, where Hazlitt decided to start developing these this book. Um, I don't think it's really important to get to the heart of the lesson that he's trying to convey and the message he's trying to convey. So let's just dive right on into chapter one, which is entitled The Lesson. Economics is haunted by more fallacies than any other study known to man. This is no accident. The inherent difficulties of the subject would be great enough in any case, but they are multiplied a thousandfold by a factor that is insignificant in, say, physics, mathematics, or medicine, the special pleading of selfish interests. While every group has certain economic interests identical with those of all groups, every group has also, as we shall see, interests antagonistic to those of all other groups. While certain public policies would in the long run benefit everybody, other policies would benefit one group only at the expense of all other groups. The group that would benefit by such policies, having such a direct interest in them, will argue for them plausibly and persistently. It will hire the best Bible minds to devote their whole time to presenting its case. And it will finally either convince the general public that its case is sound, or so befuddle it that clear thinking on the subject becomes next to impossible. In addition to these endless pleadings of self-interest, there is a second main factor that spawns new economic fallacies every day. This is the persistent tendency of men to see only the immediate effects of a given policy, or its effects only on a special group, and to neglect to inquire what the long-run effects of that policy will be, not only on that special group, but on all groups. It is a fallacy of overlooking secondary consequences. In this lies the whole difference between good economics and bad. The bad economist sees only what immediately strikes the eye. The good economist also looks beyond. The bad economist sees only the direct consequences of a proposed course. The good economist looks also at the longer and indirect consequences. The bad economist sees only what the effect of a given policy has been or will be on one particular group. The good economist inquires also what the effect of the policy will be on all groups. The distinction may seem obvious. The precaution of looking for all the consequences of a given policy to everyone may seem elementary. Doesn't everybody know, in his personal life, that there are all sorts of indulgences delightful at the moment but disastrous in the end? Doesn't every, every little boy know that if he eats enough candy he will get sick? Doesn't a fellow who gets drunk know that he will wake up the next morning with a ghastly stomach and a horrible head? 
Doesn't the dipsomaniac know that he is ruining his liver and shortening his life? Doesn't the Don Juan know that he is letting himself in for every sort of risk, from blackmail to disease? Finally, to bring it to the economic, though still personal, realm, do not the idler and the spendthrift know, even in the midst of their glorious fling, that they are heading for a future of debt and poverty? Yet when we enter the field of public economics, these elementary truths are ignored. There are men regarded today as brilliant economists who deprecate saving and recommend as brilliant, as squandering on a national scale as the way of economic salvation. And when anyone points to what the consequences of these policies will be in the long run, they reply flippantly as might the prodigal son of a warning father, in the long run, we are all dead. And such shallow wisecracks pass as devastating epigrams and the ripest wisdom. But the tragedy is that, on the contrary, we are already suffering the long-run consequences of the policies of the remote or recent past. Today is already tomorrow, which the bad economists yesterday urge us to ignore. The long-run consequences of some economic policies may become evident in a few months. Others may not become evident for several years. Still others may not become evident for decades. But in every case, those long-run consequences are contained in the policy as surely as the hen was in the egg, the flower and the seed. From this aspect, therefore, the whole of economics can be reduced to a single lesson, and that lesson can be reduced to a single sentence. The art of economics consists in looking not merely at the immediate, but at the longer effects of any act or policy. It consists in tracing the consequences of that policy, not merely for one group, but for all groups. Nine-tenths of the economic fallacies that are working such dreadful harm in the world today are the result of ignoring this lesson. Those fallacies all stem from one of two central fallacies, or both. That of looking only at the immediate consequences of an act or proposal, and that of looking at the consequences only for a particular group to the neglect of other groups. It is true, of course, that the opposite error is possible. In considering a policy we ought not to concentrate only on its long-run results to the community as a whole, this is the error often made by the classical economists. It resulted in a certain callousness toward the fate of groups that were immediately hurt by policies or developments which proved to be beneficial on that balance and in the long run. But comparatively few people today make this error, and those few consist mainly of professional economists. The most frequent fallacy by far today, the fallacy that emerges again and again in nearly every conversation that touches on economic affairs, the error of a thousand political speeches, the central sophism of the new economics, is to concentrate on the short-run effects of policies on special groups and to ignore or belittle the long-run effects on the community as a whole. The new economists flatter themselves that this is a great, almost a revolutionary advance over the methods of the classical or orthodox economists, because the former take into consideration short-run effects, which the latter often ignored. But in themselves ignoring or slighting the long-run effects, they are making the far more serious error. They overlook the woods in their precise and minute examination of particular trees. Their methods and conclusions are often profoundly re reactionary. They are sometimes surprised to find themselves in accord with 17th century mercantilism. They fall, in fact, into all the ancient errors, or would, if they were not so inconsistent, that the classical economists, we had hoped, had once and for all got rid of. It is often sadly remarked that the bad economists present their errors to the public better than the good economists present their truths. It is often complained that demagogues can be more plausible in putting forward economic nonsense from the platform than the honest man, men who try to show what is wrong with it. But the basic reason for this not to be ought not to be mysterious. The reason is that the demagogues and bad economists are presenting half-truths. 
they are speaking only of the immediate effect of a proposed policy or its effect upon a single group. As far as they go, they might often be right. In these cases, the answer consists in showing that the proposed policy would also have longer and less desirable effects, or that it could benefit one group only at the expense of all other groups. The answer consists in supplementing and correcting the half-truth with the other half. But to consider all the chief effects of a proposed course on everybody often requires a long, complicated, and dull chain of reasoning. Most of the audience finds this chain of reasoning difficult to follow and soon becomes bored and inattentive. The bad economists rationalize this intellectual debility and laziness by assuring the audience that it need not even attempt to follow the reasoning or judge it on its merits because it is only classicism or laissez-faire or capitalist apologetics or whatever the term of abuse may happen to strike them as effective. We have stated the nature of the lesson and of the fallacies that stand in its ways in abstract terms. But the lesson will not be driven home, and the fallacies will continue to go unrecognized unless both are illustrated by examples. Through these examples, we can move from the most elementary problems in economics to the most complex and difficult. Through them, we can learn to detect and avoid first the crudest and most palpable fallacies, and finally some of the most sophisticated and elusive. To that task, we shall now proceed. So that actually concludes chapter one. We're going to dive right into chapter two because it's only a page long and it's a really important chapter uh, relevant to the first chapter. Um, this chapter two is going to begin part two, um, the lesson applied. Um, and that chapter's title is The Broken Window. Let us begin with the simplest illustration possible. Let us, emulating Bastiat, choose a broken pane of glass. A young hoodlum, say, heaves a brick through the window of a baker's shop. The shopkeeper runs out furious, but the boy is gone. A crowd gathers and begins to stare with quiet satisfaction at the gaping hole in the window and the shattered glass over the bread and pies. Over a while, after a while, the crowd feels the need for philosophic reflection, and several of its members are almost certain to remind each other or the baker that, after all, the misfortune has a bright side. It will make business for some glazier. As they begin to think of this, they elaborate upon it. How much does a new plate glass window cost? $250? That will be quite a sum. After all, if windows were never broken, what would happen to the glass business? Then, of course, the thing is endless. The glazier will have $250 more to spend with other merchants, and these, in turn, will have $250 more to spend with still other merchants, and so ad finitum. The smashed window will go on providing money and, and employment in ever-widening circles. The logical conclusion from all this would be, if the crowd drew it, that the little hood who threw the brick, far from being a public menace, was a public benefactor. Now let us take another look. The crowd is at least right in its first conclusion. This little act of vandalism will in the first instance mean more business for some glazier. The glazier will be no more unhappy to learn of the incident than an undertaker to learn of a death. But the shopkeeper will be out $250 that he was planning to spend for a new suit. Because he had to replace a window, he will have to go without the suit or some equivalent need or luxury. Instead of having a window and $250, he now has merely a window. Or, as he was planning to buy the suit that very afternoon, Instead of having both a window and a suit, he must be content with the window and no suit. If we think of him as a part of the community, the community has lost a new suit that might otherwise have come into being and is just that much poorer. The glazier's gain of business, in short, is merely the tailor's loss of business. No new employment has been added. The people in the crowd were thinking only of two parties to the transaction, the baker and the glazier. They had forgotten the potential third party involved, the tailor. They forgot him precisely because he will not now enter the scene. They will see the new window in the next day or two. They will never see the extra suit precisely because it, would nev it will never be made. They see only what is immediately visible to the eye. 
All right, that concludes today's read. Um, in this next part, we'll continue on into our analysis. All right, welcome to the review slash analysis part of the video where we'll go over what we just read. So it, I think the second chapter is significantly more important in understanding what Henry Hazlitt is going to do in this read because it's going to form the basis of every single chapter moving forward. Um, and, you know, I talked about this in my review, but in this manner, the lesson can become a bit redundant, which is the broken window fallacy that we just just, just finished reading. Um, and he applies that singular lesson to um, a, a series of economic fa uh, or that one lesson to a variety of different fallacies. Um, whereas, which we can contrast that, of course, with Thomas Sowell, who takes a handful of fallacies and works backwards, works the other way, and points out why they're fallacies, um, and points out and uses various lessons to uh, to debunk a, a series of fallacies. Whereas. Uh, a short series of fallacies, whereas Hazlitt takes one lesson, beats you over the head with it. I talked about this in my review. Link is in this video's description. As I said in the review, uh, if we get through about, we're going to finish this read, but if we get halfway through the read and you're kind of like me and was like, yeah, okay, I, I get it. I get where he's going with this. That's why we're going to do a parallel read with uh, Thomas Sowell's Economic Facts and Fallacies. So, Again, if you find that this that this read is going to get redundant in the lesson that it's uh, trying to convey, then you guys can hop on over to that. When I start that series, I'll post the link in this video's description to that series. So I think before we can really get into the broken, Bastiat's broken window fallacy, um, I think we need to walk back a timeline from 1946, when Henry Hazlitt wrote Economics in One Lesson, all the way back to 1776, when uh, Adam Smith in his The Wealth of Nations, made the great realization that has formed the the entirety, the basis for the entirety of economics to this day. Um, and that is that in a mutually consensual transaction, everybody is benefited. Um, it's a self-evident truth that, that we experience it in our everyday lives all the time. Um, if you go to the gas station and buy a candy bar for, say, two bucks, um, because that's how much it is nowadays, or God forbid, to Yankee Stadium um, and buy a hot dog for 12 bucks because that's how much it is today. Um, what is self-evidently true is that you would rather have the hot dog than the $12, and the vendor would rather have the $12 than the hot dog, at least in the moment. So at least from the perspective of the participants to the transaction, because it was mutually consensual, they self-evidently are bettered by it. In the case of this microphone, this is a Shure SM58. When I go to look to the store to buy the microphones, they're roughly $100. In this case, I would rather have the microphone, and the shopkeep would rather have the $100. So in their eyes, the microphone is is le worth less than $100. And in my eyes, it's worth uh, 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 who knows how much more, but but more. In this case, we have both gotten richer because instead of having $100, I have something that's worth more than $100. And instead of having the microphone, they have the $100, which they perceive as being worth more than the microphone. I taught, we can actually remove, um, we can actually remove currency from the transaction to make it a little bit more easy to understand. And I actually did this and talked about this in my series on interference on my other channel. That's the Captain Phoenix channel. I will link uh, to that series in this video's description. Really, the first video is the only part that's important to the lesson that we're going to go over today. And that is, imagine that there is a farmer. We'll call him Farmer Brown. And he farms oats. And there is a farrier. We'll call him Farrier Smith. And what farriers do is they shoe horses, but they do some other um, metal work as well. And then let's, let's return ourselves to the pre-industrial era where uh, farriers did a lot more than just shoe horses, but that was the primary, their primary um, work was in shoeing horses. So Farmer Brown is a subsistence farmer. He farms oats. He goes out and takes a great big risk and gets these horses. The horses allow him to do way more productivity. And a lot, the horses allow him to be way more productive because he, turn, he instead of you know, tilling the soil himself, he's got the beasts of burden to do an enormous more, a lot more work than he as a human being could possibly ever do in a day. That allows him to produce a, a massive excess of oats. Unfortunately, in taking that risk, he also needs to maintain the horses. And part of maintaining those horses and making sure that their, their hooves are shoot. 
If he doesn't maintain, if he doesn't make sure their hooves are shooed, the productivity is completely lost. And whatever investment he put dumped into the horses, whatever risk he took in getting those horses, which may simply have been taming wild horses, right? Uh, not bothering, going a little hungry for a little while and not bothering to harvest his oats or maintain his oats as well as he could have. And, you know, taming some wild horses, let's say. Let's say he manages to do that. Because he has this unbelievable access of oats, let's see he has enough, uh, enough access um, to not only feed his horses, but to also save up some oats and now pay the farrier, Smith, to shoe his horses. In this case, it is self-evidently true that the farrier, Smith, is benefited in this mutual, mutually consensual exchange by, uh, instead of doing his own subsistence farming for oats, however many oats he can get, by going into the farrier's, into his shop and shoeing Smith's horses if, again, the exchange is in exchange for oats, um, if the exchange is mutually consensual, this is self-evidently true. He would rather spend the time ferrying the horses than in the field doing a harv- um, it, taking care of his fields and harvesting his own oats. Um, and this is true in the short run as well as in the long run, because if the farmer then has the ability to save up those oats, Maybe and and that maybe what winds up happening is he can you know hire a, a farmhand and again the farmhand who was doing subsistence farming has a decision to make: Do I go work for Farmer Brown or do I maintain myself in my co-op, if you will, in subsistence farming? If he chooses the employment, he is self-evidently bettered by that employment than maintaining himself in his own subsistence farming. If this excess of oats allows Smith, or for a Brown now, to not have to worry about certain things like repairing his windows, like repairing his house, like, you know, uh, maintaining some of the animals. He, maybe he can pay a farmhand to do some of these things. The, in the long run, what allow, that allows him to do is specialize. And then maybe he gets really, really, really good at growing and harvesting oats. And the other farmers, of course, around him, let's say he starts buying up all their land and hiring out all these farmhands. Well, because he's done all of this, he's got, he's going to need a lot more horses. In order to remain as productive as he was, he's going to need a lot more beasts of burden. So he needs more shoes for his horses, which means the farrier then can spend more time in the shop specializing on the farrying. And this is the basis of, of all major innovation since that since the era of specialization, once a society has the ability to specialize, you get a technological explosion. And that means that if the farrier can sit inside a shop and he says to himself, huh, you know, there's a better way to go about doing the shoeing. Like I can improve technologically on the shoeing and the, uh, not only the shoes, but maybe the process itself. Maybe the technological advance is just simply in the efficiency of his own business, which allows him to either do more work and shoe more horses at the same price or to lower his own price. Or maybe he's able to turn around his horses, the, the horses so quickly that all of the farmers in the area who have taken up the, the, the idea of taming wild horses and, and using them as beasts of burden or maybe, um, you know, the beast of maybe Farmer Brown realizes that, hey, um, a male horse and a female horse allow him to make more horses. So he sells these horses off to the other subsistence farmers who then realize that these beasts of burden allow them to be way more productive. Um, and because they're newborn, you know, maybe it's, it's an access so he can sell them at a price that would be lower than um, them taming their own horses. And by the way, if they buy the horses voluntarily, it is self-evident that they would rather buy the horses than tame the horses. So again, they win in the long run. And in the long run, you get, uh, uh, let's say, a a farrier who is incredibly efficient, who may even have the need at that point to hire an apprentice, who again, since it's a mutually consensual transaction, is obviously bettered by working in the shop than he is subsistence farming. If we remove the element of consent mutual consent from these transactions as and I'm going to I'm I, we will get back to the broken window fallacy briefly but if we remove the element of mutual consent from these transactions let's say smith steals the oats and let's say that smith steals enough oats doesn't and let's say brown's making so many oats has such an excess of oats that he can still pay smith to shoe his horses 
and he can still feed the horses. Well, what if the amount that the smith is stealing isn't enough to hire the apprentice? Well, the apprentice then loses out because he's stuck in subsistence farming. He doesn't have that decision to make. And again, if, he, if the decision is made to leave subsistence farming and go under someone else's employ, obviously the subsistence farmer is bettered by that transaction. So the other thing is that in the long run, if, that, if Farmer Brown doesn't have the ability to expand his business and bring on more horses, then Farmer Smith doesn't have the ability to spend more time in the shop, which is self-evidently, which is self-evidently a more valuable time to him than his own subsistence farming because he was willing to engage in the transaction in the first place. So obviously he would be willing to engage, engage in more of those transactions as a way of uh, pulling himself away from the field. So in the incredibly short run, and in an incredibly short-sighted way, yes, Farmer Brown has an excess of oats that he may not necessarily be consuming himself, but that doesn't justify Smith stealing Brown's oats, even under the circumstances where he has enough oats to feed his horses and pay Smith, in a consensual manner, to shoe Brown's horses. Everybody loses in the long run, when you remove consent from the transaction. And this brings us around nicely to the broken window fallacy. Now, the analogy that's, that Hazlitt uses, I say, is flawed in the sense of it's, it's less obvious um, the way that he's presented it, what the flaw of the broken window fallacy is. Because in the case of the broken window fallacy, the baker would rather have the window not be broken in the first place as self -ev which is self-evident because he would spend it on, as, Haz as Hazlitt presents, a suit instead. He would clearly rather spend the money on the suit than on repairing the window. Otherwise, he would break his own windows. So the, the fact, mere fact that he's obviously not breaking his own windows self is, um, self it makes it self-evident that there is a loss and it's just smashing the baker's windows. The sad part is that the hoodlum, right, maybe the suit, so so again, I said that there was a flaw in the analogy. I would not have used um, getting a new suit. I would use saving that money up for an expansion of the baker's business. Because if the baker is, if, if people are do, doing business with him, if he's staying in business, if he has money to spend on a broken window, he has money to spend to save to maybe expand his business and instead hire the hoodlum and pay the hoodlum so that the hoodlum can then instead do whatever it is he's going to do. And most importantly, the glazier, and I've done glazing. I, I, I've been a handyman for a long time. It's a near identical skill set to install new windows as every glazier around the world does. Install windows in new construction as it, as it is to repair broken panes of glass. So in that case, the skill set isn't, isn't maximized. And by that, I mean... The obviously, the self-evidently more valuable skill to the community is the installation of windows and new construction, because if the windows were never broken, the glazier would either have to start installing new windows or be out of a job. Either he is competent in his ability to recognize a market demand, or he's not. And again, Everybody wins when the window isn't broken. And if this wasn't the case, then what you'd be advocating for is the destruction of all windows all the time and all of the money just funneling straight to the glazier, which, again, self-evidently isn't the best way to, dist to distribute limited resources, scarce resources, because they're not already doing that. Because people in voluntary transactions aren't going to do that. Now, I talked about how this mutual consent, as it applies to the free exchange of ideas, um, and how that also benefits technological advancement, is the primary basis of the Jeffersonian and our, the, the notion within our founders' minds of free speech. I talked about that in my series on interference, so you guys can check that out too. But this is the lesson that Hazlitt is going to apply to virtually everything. I don't want to get too much into um, the fallacy of destruction. So that would be, well, I mean, if it's true that the glazier gets this money and gets all this work, well, 
in that ca- in, in Hazlitt's case, he says the tailor doesn't get any work. And it's true that it is se- in, in the, the, the version I would present, the, con- the contractor doesn't get any work. The hoodlum himself doesn't get any work because if the baker needs to expand his business, he needs to expand. He's probably going to need to expand, expand his employment as well. So that's so. Uh, Hazlitt is actually going to, in the very next chapter, expand upon the fallacy of destruction and about how, like, uh, if that's going to be the case, then war is a good thing because he, all of these buildings are destroyed and now we, they have to be erected, which is obviously not true because if the buildings are not destroyed in the first place, people would be doing other things that self evidently, you know, the market demands would would indicate are more value is more valuable work. Um, so. I'm not going to get too too specific because this is getting a bit long on the the short sightedness and crit- critiques that Hazlitt offers um, of other economists of his time. Um, one of the economists that he had a spat with going back and forth was um, was Keynes, John Maynard Keynes. Um, so I think that a lot of his 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 um, in this book, you're going to find that a lot of the reason he even wrote this book was as a way to counter the claims made by Keynes. Again, I've actually I've actually reviewed uh, Keynes's work as well. I'll post a link in this video's description to that uh, review as well if you'd like to check into that review. Um, and you know, this is kind of what the whole book is based on. So I'm not really going to get too much into detail on his critique of other people and his notion of short sightedness uh, in chapter one more than I already have. So hope you've enjoyed, and uh, that's been it for today. And we'll see you in the next one.